Hello and welcome to the video. I'm going to start today, if I may, by urging all of you to buy this book by Brian Wildenthal, who's an American law professor called Early Shakespeare Authorship Doubts. I think the title speaks for itself, what it's about. You can see that image there, the picture on the cover of Polly Mantier, and many of you will be aware that I've done a presentation on Polly Mantier and shown how it reveals uh, William Shakespeare to be the pseudonym of the Earl of Oxford. A very good book, very well written. You can buy it at Amazon and I strongly recommend it. Also jolly pleased to see that Brian Wildenthal is a fan and follower of the presentations I've been putting online. That, by the way, is not the reason why I'm recommending the book to you, but obviously it's satisfactory to know that these presentations are being looked at and are beginning to have some influence. Now today I want to talk about this little book called Epigram, served out in 52 several dishes for every man to taste without surfeiting, by I. C. Gent. I've called this presentation John Cook New, that's who I. C. Gent is, and many of you will be aware that it is part of a long, ongoing, ever-expanding series of similarly dull-titled presentations, all called So-and-So New, in each of which I take a contemporary witness to the fact that William Shakespeare was a pseudonym being used by the Earl of Oxford. Of course, the prima facie case of Shakespeare authorship is the Oxfordian case, as amply demonstrated in these videos. The Stratfordianism got off to its wobbly start several generations later, in fact, during the second half of the 17th century, in what E.K. Chambers called the Age of Shakespeare Mythos. To be a good historian, you need, obviously, to understand broader context of the period that you're interested in. You need to listen attentively to historical voices, to look in forensic detail at the testimony bequeathed to us by those who were actually alive at the time, those living close to events, witnessing and experiencing them. It is really no good just parroting the endemic silliness of goofy modern English lit professors when your subject is history. So history is our subject and context is crucial and let's have a look at a little bit of the context of John Cook's epigrams. Remember that epigrams are always a little bit saucy, always about contemporary matters, always um, slightly hiding things they shouldn't be saying. The author John Cook here has a short introduction to his epigrams addressed wittily to the judicious, envious and foolish reader uh, to you all, but to thee, judicious reader, as most respected, I submit my twelve nights trifles, for so I may truly call them, being then made instead of Christmas carols. So, for whatever reason, John Cook is associating the publication of this book with Christmas and Twelfth Night. We'll come back to that shortly. We don't know, alas, very much about John Cook. John Cook Gent, as he tends to call himself. He wrote this play, which is published in 1614 after his death, and we can learn from the introduction to it, written by Thomas Hayward, to gratulate the love and memory of my worthy friend, the author, so we can see that John Cook is a playwright, he's a friend of Thomas Hayward. Thomas Hayward, of course, was the an actor in the theatre troupe of the Earl of Oxford and the Earl of Worcester, the combined, combined theatre troupe. He was also once the servant of Henry Rosalie. He's very well placed in terms of knowing who's in the theatre and all the theatre folk, and clearly he has this worthy friend called Cook, who is a playwright. So all we know about Cook really is he's very closely associated with the plays and the acting theatre troupes, and he's a friend of Thomas Hayward. All that needs to be taken into account. Now, for the historical context, I'm showing you a picture of a rather wizened-looking Queen Elizabeth towards the very end of her life. You probably remember that she died on the 24th of March, 1603. Didn't want to die at all, was rather frightened of death, funny enough. Wouldn't even go to bed in case she died in her sleep and stood up in the middle of a room, behaving very oddly and madly indeed, thinking that if she lay down, she would die. It was a sad end to a glorious 44-year reign and obviously the great excuse for people to memorialise her and think about her. Here's a mournful ditty entitled Elizabeth's Loss Together with a Welcome for King James. So obviously published shortly after Queen Elizabeth's death by T.P., thought to be Thomas Pavia. And it's a song 
to a pleasant new tune. Farewell, farewell. Sorry, I don't know the tune. Farewell, brave England's joy. Gone is thy friend. Da di da. Lament, lament, you English peers. I want to draw your attention to a couple of verses down here. You poets all brave, Shakespeare, Johnson, Green, bestow your time to write for England's queen. Lament, lament, etc. Return your songs and sonnets and your lays to set fourth sweet Elizabeth's praise. So a very nice and modest, rather humble petition to a greater poet than whoever wrote this, to Shakespeare, Johnson and Green, to ask them to, to write some beautiful poetry to remember Queen Elizabeth by. Now, the very sharp, knowledgeable historians among you will have said, hang on, what is this? How could, how could Green possibly come and write a poem for the death of Queen Elizabeth because Robert Greene died in September 1592 and Queen Elizabeth died on the 24th of March 1603, so about 11 years later. Why is he mentioning Greene? Of course, if you're a Stratfordianist, you just say, oh, it's just a mistake because they always say mistake, but people don't make mistakes very much, particularly in published works. And we have to think, what is he saying by calling on Robert Greene, who is dead, to write a poem? Well, Robert Green was dead, it is true, it has to be said, but in some ways he wasn't dead. Uh, here's a work called Green's Groatsworth of Wit, which is described as written before his death and published at his dying request. In fact, this caused quite a scandal when certain people accused Henry Chettle of writing it, saying it wasn't written by Green at all, and another group said no, it was Thomas Nash who wrote it and it wasn't written by Green at all. Well, this idea of Green writing things after his death became something of an in-joke, and a great deal of books started coming out. These, by the way, I've listed on the left, are first editions of Green's works, all published for the first time in 1592. Remember that he died in September 1592, so Either he's something of an industry going on, um, or he's not writing all these things, or he's only writing some of them. The arguments go on among scholars um, to this day. Here's a work called Kind Heart's Dream, containing five apparitions with their invectives against abuses reigning. One of those apparitions in this book is Robert Greene. Of course, he's dead, and so he writes, having with humble penitence, besought pardon for my infinite sins, and paid the due to death, even in my grave was I scarce laid, when envy spit out her poison to disturb my rest. So the dead green, the ghost of green, is continuing to write, continuing to publish. Here's a work called The Repentance of Robert Green, wherein by himself is laid open his loose life, with the manner of his death, very controversial this one, whether it's actually by Green or by someone after him. The proof seems to be it's someone else. Here's another one, published in 1593, Green's News, both from heaven and hell. So, obviously, he's dead when he's writing that. Here's a marvellous one called Green in Conceit, and you actually see a beautiful picture on the front of Green actually wearing his funeral shroud. He's got up from his grave, as it says on the cover, new raised from his grave to write the tragic history of Fair Valeria of London. So you see that Green is, is continuing to write even long after he is dead. Here on the left, I put a list of first editions of Robert Green's works, which appeared after his death. Now, Green scholars can carry on arguing till they're blue in the face whether some of these were works which were by Green, which were published after his death, or some of them were not by Green. Obviously, the last one, Green's Ghost Haunting Connie Catchers, published in 1602, that's the year before Elizabeth dies, is very, very unlikely indeed to have been written by Robert Green. So, the point I am generally making is that Robert Green was an industry, probably in his lifetime, and continued to be an industry after his death. So, when this Balladeer writes, you poets brave, Shakespeare, Johnson, Green, bestow your time to write for England's Queen. Yes, he's kind of joking, but he's not being stupid. He hasn't made a mistake. He is talking about the very popular and ever Green, Robert Green, whose works continue to be pumped out long after his death and who is right up there in his mind with Shakespeare and Johnson and therefore among the three great poets who should be talking about or commemorating the life and mourning the death of Queen Elizabeth. Okay, that is some background which you need to understand 
in order to know what is going on in this book, which we're going to talk about, the epigrams of John Cook. We're going to look at epigram 12, and it's really just a passing remark, but I think it's heavy, pregnant with meaning. So the epigram starts, Who e'er will go unto the press may see the hated fathers of wild balladry. One sings in his bass note, the river Thames shall sound the famous memory of noble King James. Here the poet Cook is mocking another poet called Henry Peto, who in a ridiculous drivelling poem called England Caesar, he writes, and I quote, For royal James on silver Thames doth swim, the water hath that glory, for he glides upon the pearly mane unto his crown, silver mane of calmy Thames, sound forth the worth of our heroic James. Uh, utter drivel, welcoming uh, James on his boat to London, and that is being mocked here by Cook. He goes on to say, another says, that he will to his death sing the renowned worthiness of sweet Elizabeth. So runs their verse in such disordered strain, and with them dare great majesty profane. So he's complaining about second-rate poets writing gibberish, essentially, about the late Queen Elizabeth and the new King James. Now, this is the bit I want us to concentrate upon, because it mentions Shakespeare. Some other humbly craves for help of spirits in their sleeping graves, as he that called to Shakespeare, Johnson, Green, to write of their dead noble queen. Now, I think it's pretty obvious that he is referring to the poem we just looked at. You poets, all brave, Shakespeare, Johnson, Green, bestow your time to write for England's queen. Poets are even in the same order, Shakespeare, Johnson, Green, as the complaint in the epigrams, as he that called to Shakespeare, Johnson, Green, to write of their dead noble queen. So we see where the complaint is. But he didn't write only about the use of green in the first poem. He seems to be talking of spirits in their sleeping graves, plural, as he that called to Shakespeare, Johnson Green, to write of their dead noble queen. So it is absolutely obvious from the context of this that John Cook, in his epigram of 1604-1605, considers at least two of these poets, Shakespeare, Johnson, Green, at least two of those three, to be dead, to be spirits in their sleeping graves. Now, of course, Stratfordians will say, oh, it was just a mistake, because that's what they always say. Nonsense, nonsense. If he wanted to write that in a different way, he very easily could have written. Some others humbly crave for help of spirits in their sleeping graves, as he that called the ghost of Robert Green to write of his dead noble queen. I wrote that in 10 seconds flat. Hardly difficult to single out the joke about Robert Green. Now, as we have seen, John Cook is a friend of Thomas Hayward, and he therefore is intimately connected with the theatre scene. He knows perfectly well that Ben Jonson, who didn't even die till 1637, was still alive, just had a huge success with his play Sejanus, very much a key figure in the theatre world of London at the time. He knows perfectly well that William Shakespeare of Stratford, who didn't die until 1616, he knew that William Shakespeare of Stratford who had recently been made a groom of the chamber in connection with his participation in the King's Men Theatre Troupe, he knew perfectly well that this man from Warwickshire was not dead. He would have known that through his connections to the theatre. So what is John Cook doing? He is very cunningly inviting the reader to work out which of those three, which two of them, it has to be in the plural, were dead in 1604-1605. Well, as I say, they knew that Robert Greene was dead, they knew that Ben Jonson was not dead, and anyone connected with the theatre in London would have known that Shakespeare of Stratford was not dead. So who is dead? Well, it's William Shakespeare, the writer using that pseudonym, who we all know was Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, who died in June 1604, just a few months before this poem was published. So it becomes quite clear that John Cook joins the ranks of those contemporaries who knew that Edward de Vere was the poet behind the name William Shakespeare. Now I hear a minor cry of those who are really concentrating say, look at the timeline, you've got it wrong, Alexander. I don't think I have. Let's look at that timeline. 28th of April, 1603, Queen Elizabeth's funeral, 
It's over a year later, on the 22nd of May, 1604, that William Cotton registers that book of John Cook's epigrams, and the Earl of Oxford dies on the 24th of June, 1604. So how can it possibly be uh, that the epigrams talk about the death of the Earl of Oxford when the death happened a month after the registration? Now, when a publisher in those days entered a title into the stationer's register, he was not publishing it, but simply registering his sole right to do so. Very often you will find entries in the stationer's register for books that were not published for months, sometimes years after the date of registration. So Cook's epigrams were not in print when this title was entered to William Cotton on the 22nd of May. This particular case is interesting if you look at the entry to William Cotton. It says, entered for his copy under the hands of Master Passfield and the Wardens, 50 epigrams written by John Cook. 50 epigrams note, what do we see when the book actually comes out? Epigrams served out in 52 several dishes. Now, if you look in that book, you'll see the epigrams are carefully numbered 1 to 52. So it is absolutely obvious then that the book has changed since its registration. At least two epigrams have been added to it. Therefore, since we know that things were added after the 22nd of May, there is every reason to suppose that an allusion to the very recently died Shakespeare, Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, could have been added as well. So I do not take the date of registration as in any way signifying a problem with the interpretation of the poem that I've just laid out before you. And if you remember, it seemed to have something to do with Christmas, so I would conjecture that the book was published sometime in or shortly after December 1604. Now, a lot of people have asked, why is it that Shakespeare did not mourn, publicly mourn, the death of Queen Elizabeth? Uh, here's a book called England's Mourning Garment, which is generally ascribed to Henry Chettle, published in 1603, and you can see from the sentence at the top, uh, the funeral hastens on of that sometime most serene lady, and yet I see none, or at least past one or two, that have sung anything since her departure worth hearing. So the funeral hasn't quite yet happened, so we can date this fairly accurately when this was written, and he is complaining that the great poets don't seem to have paid much attention to her. And it is generally agreed that these lines refer to William Shakespeare, nor doth the silver-tongued Melisert drop from his honeyed muse one sable tear to mourn her death that graced his desert and to his lays opened her royal ear. Shepherd, remember our Elizabeth and sing her rape done by that Tarquin death. The allusion to Tarquin tells us that he is talking of William Shakespeare, calling him silver-tongued Melisert here. Hugely inconvenient again for Stratfordians, um, partly because he's talking about uh, Queen Elizabeth loving Shakespeare, listening to Shakespeare and uh, giving him some sort of reward, and we have no record of that for Stratford of Shakespeare. But worse than that, he calls Shakespeare silver-tongued Melisert, and you only have to turn two pages back where smooth-tongued Melisert is described as an associate of uh, Francis Walsingham and Philip Sidney. Walsingham, of course, who died in 1590, and Sidney, who died in 1586. And we have many corroborations of uh, friendship and association between the Earl of Oxford and Walsingham and Sidney, but, of course, absolutely none for Stratford Shakespeare. It was too early for him. But anyway, I bring this up because it raises the question, why did Shakespeare... Uh, not write something in memory of Queen Elizabeth after her death. Uh, once again, it's a terrible problem for the Stratfordianists because William Shakespeare of Stratford uh, was a servant of the Queen. He was a servant of the Lord Chamberlain and therefore a servant of the Queen. And he had every duty, if he were a great poet, to write a wonderful poem saying how uh, wonderful the Queen was after her death. But as we all know, uh, Shakespeare of Stratford was not a poet and he did not write the works of William Shakespeare. Those were written by Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, and there is every reason why Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, who was an intimate friend and acquaintance of the Queen throughout her life, would not go and publish uh, something mourning her death 
under the pseudonym William Shakespeare. That would have been um, extremely distasteful to have done that. We do actually have a record of his remarks, of his thoughts, let's say, concerning the death of Elizabeth, which is very beautiful. It occurs in a letter to his brother-in-law, Robert Sissel, dated the 27th of April, 1603. I cannot but find a great grief in myself to remember the mistress which we have lost, under whom both you and I from our greenest years have been in a manner brought up. And although it hath pleased God after an earthly kingdom to take her up into a more permanent and heavenly state, wherein I do not doubt but she is crowned with glory, yet the long time which we spent in her service, the acquaintance and kind familiarities wherewith she did use us, we are not ever to expect from another prince." In this common shipwreck, mine is above all the rest, who least regarded, though often comforted, of all her followers, she hath left to try my fortune among the alterations of time and chance, either without sail, whereby to take advantage of any prosperous gale, or with anchor to ride till the storm be overpassed. Well, I don't think anyone who even slightly knows the works of Shakespeare will fail to hear the tongue of William Shakespeare. In that letter of Edward de Vere to Robert Sissel, you don't need to go to the plays and find Shakespearean lines such as, I cannot be sad, but well, thou hast comforted me marvellous much to me and to the state of my great grief. The mistress which I serve, being of so young days brought up, between the promise of my greener days, I am not one that rejoices in the common wreck, be anchored in the bay where all men ride. I could go on and on and on, fishing out sentences from Shakespeare, which are entirely resonant with that letter. Now, I started with an advertisement for a book, and let me finish with an advertisement for some more books. Verus Publishing have just announced the publication of Hamlet, The Tempest, Midsummer Night's Dream, Much Ado About Nothing, Julius Caesar and Macbeth, by Edward de Vere. Perfectly happy that the works of Shakespeare forever be published as the works of Shakespeare. I don't think we need to eradicate the pseudonym, of course, but we are still in the front line of a battle here, and I think these wonderful books help to open up the subject of Shakespearean authorship, and I do urge anyone interested in it to buy these books and give them out as presents. You can find them on Amazon. What you're looking at here, actually, is the Verus Publishing website. But uh, please get involved, please buy them, please hand them around, and let's get that conversation going. I'm very pleased and excited that they should have come out. These works of Edward de Vere. Thank you very much indeed for following me through this presentation. Please press the bell button and subscribe if you want to know what comes up next. And please share, like, and all the sorts of things that generate interest in what I believe is the most interesting historical subject being spoken about today. Thank you very much for watching.